Hello and welcome to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Yerdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. Morgan, go ahead and ring that bell. Uh, we are taping this on Monday as I'm getting all the way out of here and heading to uh, <laughs> to Mexico. So we are uh, fresh off of uh, a weekend full of boxing, including Danny Garcia's victory over Robert Guerrero, uh, PBC making its debut on Fox over the weekend. Yep. Uh, our man Jason Bergman fought in New Zealand uh, against Joseph Parker earlier on, and we had a knockout of the year candidate on Showbox as well. Yes. Rob Brandt scoring a really scary one on Friday night. Yes, um... Yeah, a full weekend. I, Jason Backney Bergman. I, this is what we because he used to fight up here in Toronto. And we noticed that man had a lot of acne on his back mm-hmm. and a muscular physique, which and, sometimes has a correlation and other times doesn't. And sometimes doesn't. But that's I can't believe that guy's still fighting. Um, but you know what? This 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 sport never stops surprising me in terms of who will wash up. Uh, our man Dan Rayfield has finally clued in because he's he's all over a lot of stuff but he had no reason to know that the the fight that the the card that james tony was going to quote unquote headline in ottawa at the end of this month uh has been canceled that's been off box rack for a while but oh yeah again, yeah um under the right or wrong circumstances that would have that 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 card would have come off yeah uh no we knew and again it's not dan's fault he didn't know that no, no. because a local card in ottawa we only know it because we run in canadian circles for whatever yeah, well, reason i got the sim horton uh, well Tim Hortons is available in Maine, Michigan, Ohio, yeah, uh, all over New York. You don't know where we are nope. right now. Uh, but if we were in Canada, we would know all about uh, <laughs> exactly. this card going on. I also happen to know that people, uh, because they also didn't know this card wasn't going to come off. And, and listen, with the moment this card was scheduled, I knew this wasn't going to happen. Remember, But a lot of people don't have that kind of foresight. So people bought tickets to this, oh, no. Na- uh, mainly people who were there to see Tony Lewis, right. who does sell tickets in Cornwall and in the Ottawa area and whatnot. Ontario, he is a, good, sure. he's a popular local draw yes. there. They bought tables and Ooh. tickets and whatnot, and they will never get refunded for this. So now Tony Lewis has issued statements to the, to the promoter um, and is talking to the local press and whatnot, trying to pressure him to give this money back. Yes. Uh, from what I understand, he has vanished with this money. <sighs> Which is not... Which is a completely foreseeable outcome. Again, when you look at the various iterations of this card, remember when they first started talking about it? It was supposed to be in November. Steve Molitor was supposed to be on it. Yes. That guy, he was a great champion for a while, but he hasn't fought since what, 2011, maybe? Yeah. And seemed pretty content in retirement, too. Well, exactly. Uh, remember Guillermo Rigondi? I was supposed to be on yes, it. Yes, that's <laughs> All right. Yeah, kinds yeah. Of stuff oh, was yeah. Supposed to happen yeah. On this card. James Tony in the main event. Yeah. And, and the names associated with this card should have told you that it wasn't going to happen uh, in Eastern Ontario, especially not going to happen on the same night as Kovalev Pascal. No. But yeah. Definitely wasn't going to happen. But unfortunately for the, for the fighters, um, a lot of fighters in the Ontario region. Yes. Um, when you get any sniff of an opportunity for a fight somewhere, you gotta take it. You have to take it, and you kind of have to take it at face value too. Mm-hmm. You sort of have to believe them. So it's not just about this promoter screwing over the fans, who may or may not get their money back in any sort of a timely fashion. Nope. But the people who really will never get a refund are all those fighters who are signed up to be on that card. Yes. I had to believe it because just in case it does happen, you better right. be prepared because your life is on the line if the fight does happen. Exactly. You put in eight weeks of training camp or whatever, six weeks, pay your own money, right? someone's money, your manager's money, your own, to bring in sparring partners to stop, take time off of work, do whatever, and then the fight doesn't happen? Right. I mean, they, they, are, uh, they are the bigger victims than even the paying fans who yes. do absolutely have a case as well. Yeah, well, because it's, it's their livelihood, right? And if someone, you know, pulls some stunt, you know, and, and you know, we don't get paid, we won't be happy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we will not be happy. The thing is, but we can withhold our labor like a, 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 a boxer. What can he really do? A guy in Tony Lewis's situation, and again, and Tony Lewis gets it worse because he's again, as you as you noted, he's the guy uh, in that part of the country um, who's really selling the tickets, and all these people are going to buy tickets to come see him. Yeah, and you cancel the card, and it all it looks bad on him. And even if his fans understand that it's not his fault because they know he's not the promoter, uh, that's not going to get them their money back. No, it doesn't. And and as much as we talk all the time about how it's overblown. 
um, when people suggest that any uh, any event, whatever it is, is some kind of referendum on the sport of boxing. Right. But when it comes to these things, it does sort of have an impact because local guy buying a ticket yes. who gets screwed over and a fight doesn't happen, they don't know the difference between PBC and an HBO card and just right. a card at, at, at any local arena. Right. It's boxing to them, right? So boxing yes. gets gets branded with this idea that it's these haphazard events that might not happen. There's, there's no recourse for getting my money back yes. if the event doesn't happen, so on and so forth. That and also they're probably just gonna be mad at Tony Lewis. Well, Tony right. Lewis was going door to door, probably selling these tickets too. Well, well, right. And so the next time around, like yeah, maybe PBC comes to town. Maybe it's another ESPN card, um, and there actually is money there. But because Tony Lewis has burned them before, they feel Tony Lewis has burned them before, even though it wasn't Tony Lewis burning them. They feel Tony Lewis has burned them before. Next time around, they're gonna think twice before spending money. Like, look at the look at the way the economy is right now. People. Do, Inflation is higher, food costs more, gas costs less, food costs more, but people don't have money to waste on stuff. You gotta pay $8 for a cauliflower. Right. Yeah, I, can't, <laughs> I can't be out here spending money on no. uh, boxing tickets. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, thankfully, on Saturday night, you didn't have to pay to watch boxing because it was on free cable yes. uh, on Fox as Danny Garcia defeated Robert Guerrero uh, in the main event in uh, welterweight action, picking up the uh, WBC welterweight title, yes. which, out of the blue... And again, having worked on PBC broadcast from the beginning, yes. it was hard a hard rule that yep. we could not mention the names of titles on broadcast ever. Really? So, and and this it wasn't really a secret either. But you could say things like it was a, a uh, we're fighting for a welterweight title, right? So and so is a, a welterweight champion, or, or just welterweight champion. Just sort of forget the fact that there are other people out there. Yes, but the the name of the title was mentioned, was shown physically, because yes. those were also taken out of the broadcast usually too. They would try to avoid shots right. of uh, the title belts on there. Um, but they were very open and honest about the fact that this was for a vacant WBC welterweight title that was vacated by Floyd Mayweather. A couple of things. One, it's... Uh, you can... You can... You can edit out the name of the title you can you can issue a proclamation you can issue a rule against mentioning the name of the title if you think your audience is really uh broad and general and mainstream and not too savvy about boxing um in that in that case you just tell them this is a title fight and they exactly don't, and the non-boxing fan doesn't make a distinction between a champion and the champion right um so it's kind of an admission that they know that actual boxing fans are watching um and the thing about and there's there's like a sweet spot because there's there's the point at which actual boxing fans care about the belt that's at stake, but then when you get even more invested, you, you begin again to stop caring about the belt that's at stake because you just want to see the fight because you realize how much politics is involved in 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 negotiating all these different title fights. So this is kind of where PBC is stuck in the middle, right? Well, and I think they were stuck in this fight too because, again, the uh, the main marketing chip when it came to Robert Guerrero is he lost to Floyd Mayweather. Yes. He lost to Keith Thurman who was on commentary. So without exactly saying what belt is on the line, if you just said this is for the welterweight title of the right. world, uh, that wouldn't really resonate with the audience. You'd kind of have to say, okay, Floyd has now stepped aside. So this guy that lost to him, we don't know how competitive he was or how competitive right. he wasn't. He's in this fight, and so is Danny Garcia, well, who was the legitimate champion. I went forward. Yes, and there are a few things going on because one, they also because in 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 this way, boxing is not like wrestling. Remember when you were growing up watching wrestling? You had WCW or NWA if you're really old, yeah, and the WWF for the WWE, and like. A guy would come over and you would act like he had no history in this other organization. Right, yeah. Yeah, you just act like the other one didn't exist. Um, but in boxing, with PBC and the HBO side of the, the divide, you can't really do that. So you can try to position this fight as the welterweight title fight, but casual fans also understand that Manny Pacquiao and Tim Bradley are about to fight, um, that Floyd Mayweather's hanging around out there somewhere. So they're going to understand, like, oh, wait a minute. These guys beat Mayweather? No, wait. What about the the, the fight between Pacquiao and, and, and Bradley? Um, I thought that was the welterweight championship. So you do have to be a little bit more specific because fans are aware that there are other brands of boxing out there, and they're going to start asking questions. Well, in this case, uh, this title fight uh, actually did turn out to be uh, quite entertaining, mm. and we'll get into uh, the bout itself. We have to hit the break, but we'll be back with more of uh, Fight Network Boxing Weekly when we return here after the break.
Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. Let's get into the in-ring specifics yes. of what we saw in the uh, main event on Premier Boxing Champions on Fox. So Danny Garcia gets the win over Robert Guerrero. Coming into this fight, I think a lot of people just sort of cast this fight aside, assumed it was going to be a very easy victory uh, yes. for Danny Garcia. Um, and in typical Danny Garcia fashion, <laughs> for the first half of this fight, uh, made it look like this was going to be a very competitive fight. And it yes. was a very competitive it fight. It was competitive. It was the a first, very competitive listen, fight. The first six rounds, uh, I had, it was at least even, or maybe Garcia... Sorry, maybe Guerrero winning four. You went three or yeah. four in the first oh, yeah. round, yeah. for sure. Um, and that's the thing with Danny Garcia. If you were to just make uh, highlight videos yes. of Danny Garcia from round seven onwards, yes. everyone would believe in the hype. Yep. Of Danny Garcia, they they would they would think he's a top ten pound for pound fighter. They would they would they would believe that he deserves all of these accolades. Yes, but if you see him in the beginning, you know the engine just doesn't get going for Danny for whatever reason. Whether he's taking the time to to calculate with his opponent, whatever it is. But once he really gets going, um, you know there are a lot of things that Danny Garcia isn't excellent at, but he's a very very sharp puncher. He's a precise yes. counter puncher. And once that gets rolling, then he's really tough to deal with. Well, and, and the problem Garcia was having early on is that he wasn't uh, initiating. And he's trying to be a little bit too precise, trying to throw one punch at a time, one punch at a time. Um, and, he, and he wasn't uh, giving Guerrero enough to think about as Guerrero came in. And Guerrero just did what Guerrero does. He just moves forward, keeps moving forward, and was kind of smothering Garcia and, and, and leaving Garcia a little bit confused. And then as the fight progressed and, and, and Garcia started putting his punches together, started initiating a little bit and making Guerrero stop and think before he rushed in, uh, that's when you started seeing a lot more success from, from Garcia. Um, which, you know, at least geographically, yes. is what we thought was going to happen in this fight. I didn't under, you know, all due respect to Keith Thurman, but he seemed surprised that Danny Garcia was moving backwards. And Danny Garcia usually moves backwards. Right. I mean, he's not, other than when he was facing a guy like Pauli Malignaggi, who at all costs is going to be the guy boxing off the back foot. Yes. Um, Danny is usually the guy who is, at best, standing there with you in the pocket, yep. but most of the time at least being the guy who is not the nominal aggressor, the guy who would be moving backwards and countering to some extent. Well, yeah, and what you saw too early on was... Uh Garcia trying to lead with the left hook because every and the thing is everyone knows that's his punch, right? Everyone knows that's yeah. his punch. You saw him trying to lead with the left hook and you saw those left hooks not landing. And then when you started seeing him throw combinations and put the left hook at the end, that's when you really started seeing him connect and really started seeing him get Robert Guerrero's attention. Uh, those left hooks look so unorthodox uh, yes. from Danny Garcia because he turns them all the way over yep. um, like Triple G does. I mean, there's two ways. There's no wrong way to throw a left hook. Yes. You, you can just throw it kind of straight across without bringing the elbow all yeah, the way he does up. It like you can't a, like turn the, the Muay Thai the downward Muay Thai all the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he throws hook, that. Yes. Um, but it's so accurate and it's so it might It's it's one of the best left hooks in boxing. Yes. And Robert Guerrero took a bucket full of those yes. in the last seven rounds. Um, Robert Guerrero eats a lot of punches, yeah, man. And, and, and it's like it's it's. It's scary at times how flush he gets hit with these shots. God bless Robert Guerrero. He's a tough guy. Um, after the fight, him and his dad, Ruben, were saying, well, all, all Garcia did was hold and run. Um, but no, and how'd you get all those welts on your face if the guy was only holding and running? Like, you have to, I, I, I get his heart and I get his pride. Um, but you also have to be honest with yourself. The guy was punching you. That's why he won the fight. Sure. You didn't get you didn't get those bruises on your face because Ruben was yelling at you real harshly in the corner. It's because you're getting punched. And and Guerrero is at the point in his career now. Again, we talk about this all the time. There's guys he can beat. That's just not the elite guys. And at this point, yeah, he's a professional opponent. He's a trial horse. And you know his biggest qualification for any of these fights is that he lost to Mayweather, right? So he's elite by association. So you beat him and you beat the guy that beat Mayweather. And he could hang around and get a few more fights like this against contenders. Like, it wouldn't surprise me to see uh, Guerrero versus Errol Spence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which I'm, I'm fine with. I'm fine with it. Errol Spence will probably uh, tattoo Robert Guerrero, but... yeah. But there could be early rounds that look very similar yes. to the Garcia fight, where he's like, oh, okay, no one's been able to apply this reasonably kind of pressure. intelligent pressure on yes. me 
before and like no one's been able to get this close to me without me saying okay right um so i, I think that's a reasonable test for errol spence if they want to if they want to do that yeah, next. And, and, and errol spence is ready now for if not the elite guys who have fought the elite yes right yeah this is when we saw errol spence fight here in toronto like it was a good test for him uh he was really impressive and we said hey wait a minute like the guy he fought on on thanksgiving i don't know why he's fighting that guy sure he's ready for a guerrero yeah um I'm maybe ready for Alberto, but definitely ready for Guerrero. I would love to see that. Uh, still amazing how much of, uh, and you brought it up with Robert Guerrero, but how much of the selling of this fight and the selling of the fight in general had to do with Floyd Mayweather to the point where it, the, almost the entire storyline by the final three rounds uh, was about the fact that Floyd was in the crowd. Yes. Um, you know, we... <laughs> Gus Johnson come back? had the line that we all love Floyd Mayweather, which I, I can't I can't endorse. I, I can't quite endorse that. Um, but uh, <laughs> does Gus yeah. Johnson have internet access? I, I don't know if he does. <laughs> I'm not sure if he does or not. Uh, but uh, almost everything about selling that fight, you know, from the fact that you know Floyd vacates this belt, here's a former Floyd opponent. Yes. Uh, hey, Keith Thurman, do you think that Floyd could come back and fight Danny Garcia? Like everything about that still. Centered around Floyd Mayweather, and it's like uh, boxing isn't ready to move on from Floyd. I would love to come on here and talk about something other than Floyd Mayweather, but he's still so central to everything that's happening because other people keep placing him in well, that position. Yes, but that's a, that's a choice the people producing that show made. Yes, of course. Yeah. You could have easily have just positioned him as the most famous guy in the audience. Sure, well, him along with Eddie Murphy. Um, but the the decision. Uh, to use Floyd Mayweather as the standard by which every everybody else in this fight is measured, uh, that's the one the producers made. And when you get to these PBC shows, because it's not that different from uh, the Brazil fight in that to really make these, to, to, to the way they're selling these fights can only work for so long. There's only so long you can uh, sell Danny Garcia and Robert Guerrero uh, in relation to a guy who is retired in the same way that like Dominic Brazil uh, th they want us to like Dominic Brazil as a boxer because he used to play college football after a while you're just gonna have he's just gonna have to show us what I'm he a can boxer. do yeah. as a boxer right because none of us have seen him play college football because he played at a small college and he's been out of college probably eight or nine years we doesn't matter and so in Mayweather every month that passes is one more month that he's retired so it doesn't matter and the thing is you stay retired long enough and people stop caring how good you were this is why Michael Jordan is an internet meme and not the greatest player in the history of the yeah, NBA he's right a crying face. people stop caring so in a year from now um, it won't matter well this guy lost to Mayweather great but what's he doing for me right now We'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, people's fetish with a uh, returning uh, Floyd Mayweather. We'll get into that, and we'll get into uh, the rest of the card, including Dominic Brazil's uh, somewhat miraculous victory <laughs> over Amir Khan. Uh, on Not the Amir Khan, card. Amir Mansour. Uh, and Amir Mansour, Although, sorry, yes. Uh, Amir Khan, Amir Khan he's, he might come up he, a little bit later he on, He might too. call out Dominic Brazil if he thinks he can get paid. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic Brazil's running from me. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll touch on Amir Khan a little bit later <laughs> as well. We'll be back with more here on Fight Number Boxing Weekly. Welcome back to Fight Number Boxing Weekly. Corey Erdman and I'm Morgan Campbell here with you. So because Floyd Mayweather was seated ringside uh, at Premier Boxing Champions yes. at the Staples Center over the weekend, uh, we now have a string of new articles about how Floyd Mayweather might be returning to boxing. And, you know, granted... His language has softened a little bit when you ask him uh, about coming back. He'll say, uh, as of right now, I, d I don't really want to or whatever. Yes. However, um, we can concede that no one has ever said that this guy is coming back. And everyone around Floyd says that he's not coming back. So I don't understand why we're writing stories about what this. What the hell is he coming back for? What do, what do people not understand about having $300 million in the bank? Sorry, $300 million payday yeah. your last time out. Who knows how much in the bank? Um, Seven-figure yearly income off of interest. Um, and all of this now, and you don't have to wake up at 3 in the morning to train anymore. You don't have to get punched in the face by really dangerous people anymore. What do people not understand about that? Plus, he's old. 
Floyd Mayweather is the same age as Peyton Manning. You don't see Peyton Manning. Well, he might come back. Maybe Peyton Manning will just keep playing. <laughs> and we'll see what happens next week. Until he so, wins yeah. another Super Bowl, yeah. right? Um, and I don't know if folks don't understand about that. And, and and the reason you know his language might be softening is because he's also involved on the promotional side. He's in business with all the people who have an interest in him presenting the possibility that he'll come back. Yes, right? however far-fetched. Because, again, look how they were selling this fight yesterday. Every 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 positive attribute either of these fighters was possessed uh was only positive insofar as it related to their relationship with floyd mayweather so floyd mayweather says yeah you know what there's a chance i might come back and fight one of these guys then all of a sudden we're more interested well not us but mainstream fans because they've heard of mayweather are more interested in this fight because they're like well this might be the guy that fights mayweather next because yeah. if there's no possibility of a mayweather fight um if you're a mainstream fan uh, who pays attention to Mayweather, Pacquiao, and then not much else in boxing? Uh, it's a lot harder to sell these guys, uh, sell Guerrero, sell Garcia. So this is part of what's happening. And let's not act like Floyd Mayweather hasn't um, cynically, uh, cynically manipulated uh, the public's tastes and preferences and biases before because that's how he got as rich uh, as he is. So I don't, he's not, absolutely not above teasing the idea that he's going to come back when he has no intention of coming back. The man is almost 40 years old in a lighter weight class and he knows enough... It, Knows enough about boxing, has smart enough people around him to understand, like, there's a good time to go, and this is as good a time as any. Yeah. And let's not forget that this guy was training with his uncle. His uncle, Roger, fought too long, and right. every he day. Right, he sees the effects every, every day with his father and his he has and to his talk uncle. to he this knows. guy whose who's cognitive abilities are in steep decline. Um, I know a lot of people that don't like Floyd Mayweather would like him to fight until that happens to sure. him. Sure. But Floyd Mayweather, I don't think, wants to fight until that happens to him, especially not when he's got... As much money as he has. You know who really believes he's coming back? Amir your, Khan. Your man. Amir Khan, who's seated right behind Floyd Mayweather. Uh, and fan footage uh, has captured Amir Khan basically throughout the entire fight, trying to bait Floyd into a fight and yelling at him uh, during the Garcia fight. Um, Amir Khan just will not give up. Uh, and as, as avid fans of R&B music, oftentimes we sort of <laughs> see things through the lens of our favorite R&B songs. Uh, and Amir Khan reminds us of a whole lot of R&B legends Amir, right now. Amir Khan, so if you had to ask me, Amir Khan is uh, the Keith Sweat of boxing. Uh, if you guys listen, we'll post this. There you go telling me no again, where Keith Sweat is on this woman about uh, falling in love with him. She won't fall in love with him. Keith Sweat can't figure out why. And the first thing Keith Sweat says in this song is, please be mine. And there's a, then there's a pause. And Keith Sweat's going to tell you why. She, and then he says... Because I really, really, really want to be yours. Keith Sweat doesn't say, uh, please be mine because I will make you happy. It's all about Keith Sweat. And here's Amir Khan showing up to Floyd Mayweather. Hey, let's fight. Why? Floyd Mayweather just made $300 million to fight Manny Pacquiao and probably $40 million more to fight Berto in a fight that no one watched. Um, why is he interested in a pay cut? Why? Well, because, I've, I've told you no repeatedly. Right, because it'll be good for, 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 for Amir, Amir Khan. Yeah, that's right. So let me... And, Ke and Amir Khan is left with, there you go, telling me no again. There you go. Because like there Keith Sweat, Keith is only concerned with what he can gain yes. out of relationships. Yeah, uh, and most of that gain is just sexual for Keith Sweat. Yes. Uh, for Amir Khan, it's only about him because it, why, I don't know what Floyd would get out of returning from <laughs> yeah, retirement there's not, to do there's, this. There's nothing in it for Floyd. Nothing, nothing. at all. Uh, Amir, but, in this case also, uh, in uh, as it pertains to his case with Kel Brook, yes. is a whole lot like high five. Like like our man Tony Thompson. Rest in, in peace to Tony Thompson. Rest in peace, Tony Thompson. Uh, in the song Unconditional Love. <laughs> Because he'll say Amir Khan, you know, wants these big fights. Yep. Amir Khan says, "I'll fight anybody. Uh, I, I I will take on all comers." <laughs> but then he want, he has these ridiculous demands, right. much like high five in <laughs> unconditional love, where the love is supposed to be unconditional. But, but then <laughs> it, it's about he will climb the highest peak. It, yeah, that's right. So in the deepest sea, he will cross the <laughs> desert land. How far will you go? <laughs> would you do the same for would, me? Would you do the same for me. But at least Tony, at least Tony Thompson is saying he will do these things, right? He's not saying do these things for me and then I might do them for you That's which is right. what Amir Khan is saying to Kel Brook That's right. I need 10 million dollars <laughs> you might get paid to but I need 10 million dollars <laughs> you don't even get paid 10 million dollars uh, like is Bradley going to make 10 million dollars to fight Pacquiao? No. No. Right, you don't even get paid you don't even get a 10 million dollar guarantee as the Pacquiao or Mayweather B-side. Where does Amir Khan think this money is coming from? Now Amir Khan does have fans. Of course he does. And I 
he can have fans, but for the fans to think that Amir Khan is as good as the Amir Khan fans think he is, is absolute insanity. Remember in Toronto, where we may or may not be based, there was that news conference at the Air Canada Centre in the summer uh, when Donovan Reddick came down and, and Adonis Stevenson came down. I remember on the way in, I was talking to the security guard, the security guard from England. He said, oh, what are you doing here? Oh, yeah, boxing boxing uh, news conference. So he's like, I'm Khan. I'm like, yeah. He's like, you think you meet Mayweather? <laughs> I was like, no. no. And then he, he's like, he was surprised. This was the first time he had heard from anyone because I guess he and his English friends just talk about how everyone's scared of Amir Khan. This, he was shocked that I told him that Amir Khan couldn't beat Mayweather or Pacquiao. And I actually had to explain to this guy <laughs> that the dude who lost to Danny Garcia and barely beat Chris Algieri uh, probably isn't ready to challenge Mayweather and Pacquiao. Those guys are in a different league than he is. I think, uh, on the contrary, I think a lot of people are lining up to fight Amir Khan. I yes. think it's actually the other way around. But speaking of sleazy R&B, yes. Morgan, you know who's a big fan of sleazy R&B? Who's that? IBF heavyweight champion of the world, <laughs> Charles Martin, who's you know going to join us on the other side of the break. Uh, we'll talk about Keith Sweat. There's a right and a wrong way to fight for the heavyweight title. <laughs> and Charles Martin, he's going to try to make it last forever. As heavyweight oh, champ. Oh my goodness. We'll <laughs> talk about that and plenty more with the heavyweight champ on the other side of the break. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Yerdman and Morgan Campbell here with you. And it's not every day that you get a heavyweight champion of the world on the line with you. And uh, joining us right now is the IBF heavyweight champion of the world, Prince Charles Martin. What's going on, man? Hi, guys. Good, man. Hey, uh, first of all, congratulations uh, on the win over Vyacheslav Glaskov. And, uh, you know, we have to say we're excited to have you on here. And just to give you uh, some insight into what kind of program this is, we only care about two <laughs> things here. We care about boxing, and we care about sleazy R&B. So when we saw that you were tweeting out Keith Sweat songs and Force MD songs, oh we, we, we figured out we have the right guy on yes, the line. Yes, indeed. I was actually, I, w- I was Force MDs for Halloween. Um, wow. And that is not a joke. Yeah, in a fight, man, in a poop. <laughs> That's, you know. Yeah, man, I got a, I got a thing for R&B. Oh my goodness! Y'all catch me? <laughs> no, listen, you've you've absolutely come to the right show. Uh, so we see the last Keith Sweat, and Keith Sweat is going to show up later in this broadcast too. Uh, oh, okay. we see that you've tweeted. How deep is your love? Is that your favorite Keith Sweat song, or is there another one? No, no, I got a lot of them. I like I like different artists. You know, every now and then I'll just do that. You know, let people know what what I'm listening to. <laughs> <laughs> right, and we were also well. We were also impressed that because when you tweeted uh, Force MDs, most people only know Tender Love, right? And not a lot of people know Love Is a House. Like that's that's a, a oh, pretty yeah. deep knowledge of, of Jerry Curl R and B. But you're a little like right. you and Corey a little bit younger than I am. So you're you're not even thirty years old yet. How did you get into stuff like Force MDs and Keith oh, Sweat? Just my mom and stuff, man. And like all the songs that I used to hear when I was little, growing up. I said, mm-hmm. when I get older, I'm going to find those songs. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's... Uh... I guess it's fitting that uh, you know you uh, you came to the R and B party late. You also came uh, to boxing a little bit later uh, than most did, and yet here you are uh, as a heavyweight champion of the world. Um, I noticed even watching when when the fight was over with Glaskov, it's like you didn't even believe what had just happened. Did, did it take a couple minutes to register that you were about to get a heavyweight title around your waist in a couple minutes? Yeah, it was like first of all, I didn't even know why the fight was over you know i was confused when he kept falling on the ground i'm like what the heck is going on you know what i mean like we 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 got a fight man we're look at all these people right here look at all these people that's watching us man we're on we're on showtime tv like what are you doing falling on the ground man we're we're fighting i want to do six rounds i want to show the, the world what prince charles martin is about and what he can do so that's why I was disappointed, you know. It didn't register because the way that it ended, first of all. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. Right, and, and I how was did, just cr- <laughs> happy, man. Right, and how did you think the rest of that fight was going to go? Because as I was watching it, I, I noticed, even before the knee injury, 
you know, I noticed that, uh, you know, you're moving forward, but still using your, your reach um, and really starting to give Glasgow a hard time uh, with the lead right hooks and with the jab and the lead right hand. Um, how did you see, how did you envision the rest of that fight playing out? Man, he, I was going to knock him out, man. I just wanted to do it like putting punches together, you know, because he he was getting he was getting away, you know, and like backing up and like I had to, you know, throw feints and like come here and he'd like move out. You know, he'd be evasive and move out. So I knew I couldn't throw more than one and two punches until he until like got him to slow down. You know, until the rounds progressed. So I wasn't I'm a patient fighter. I'm a very patient fighter. Um, you know, jab here, jab there, you know, one, two you know, when I when he started like in the second, third round, in the second one, third round, you know, I'm starting to put the hook with the straight left down the pipe, you know, putting it one two to go, boom, boom. You know, that that started landing. You know, I had more stuff, man. I wanted to, you know, you know, I, I I'm a big triple G fan, you know, I train with Triple G. So, you know, I know his how he goes, boom, boom. he thinks to two to the top, rip to the body, you know, come up, rip to the body. You know, I know how to do a lot of stuff, man. So I wanted to display things that I've been working on the gym and that, that who I, who I am. And I, and I just wanted to have fun, man. I was breathing easy. You know, I, I, I do a month of strength conditioning down here. Then I go up to the mountains and do a month of boxing training with it. That's my eight-week camp while I'm still doing boxing training in the, in the first month as well. But, you know, it's strictly boxing and, and the regular strength training after, you know, Every day when I'm up in the mountains, I breathe easy in the ring, man. And I was so comfortable. You know, I just wanted to put on a, a show for the for the fans, man. You know, I, I was the, the belt's in the right hands. You know, I'm the man that was going to get that belt that night. And, um, you know, I just wanted to show the fans what I had, man. You know, nobody knew about me. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of people sort of knew that you were out there, but because you were on a lot of uh, untelevised undercards, I think a lot of people didn't understand uh, the kind of skill that you have. And I think what impressed us is that given the fact that you came to the sport a little bit later, a lot of fighters who are in that predicament don't look as relaxed as you are in the ring and definitely don't have the kind of power uh, that you seem to have as well because you were hurting Glaskov even before uh, that fight was stopped. Um, I know you told a story a little while ago about the day that you were in the gym and you discovered you actually had knockout power that there was a day that you just decided okay I'm going to bite down on my mouthpiece I'm going to stand in here with this guy um, and you gave him a black eye that day could you could you share that story with us oh yeah yeah definitely um, well there's a little thing in the, in the camp that we used to have it was called the buddy buddy system <laughs> and it was like me like because we were we were in a camp of all guys over six, six feet three inches you know over you know 235 pounds you know there was there was the littlest guy was you know 220 <laughs> you know like two i was the littlest person in the camp you know from from day one that i was the only one that they recruited you know i was 200 pounds when i came in but um we used to have a buddy buddy system because we had a spar three days a week and it was tough sparring all the time we we're getting hit by these massive guys you know massive guys pounding on each other every day to learn how to fight um so we, we came up with this thing like, okay, you know, before sparring, oh, we're sparring you, they ride on the board. Okay, you're sparring this person, you're sparring this person. We go and talk with each other like, okay, um, you don't go hard, I don't go hard. You you just throw the power hand to the body and, and we'll just jab to the head. Okay, cool, cool. So we make an agreement. Um, and and um, one time we went in there to spar, you know, and I was sparring with, with a guy who was, you know, fairly more experienced than I was. And he, we agreed to the system, and then he let off on. He, we were we were doing good, you know. We were being neutral, and then at the end of the last round, he he let loose on me. You know, he, he I was just calm, and then he started to come on. You know what I'm saying? And he he came on strong, and he and he was trying to tee off on me. And I'm like, what the hell? In my head, I'm like, and then, and then my coach was like, see, 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 that's what I mean. You know, you you playing that buddy system, and you know, he just got off on you know to, to look good in front of everybody. Because at the end of the day, it was like they were keeping data. You know, they were they were filming us, you know, and, and giving us the videos to watch, you know, and and see us progress. You know, we I got filmed from day one. You know, all my sparring sessions. You know what I mean? Like to watch myself and look at my my 
my habits and stuff and things that I didn't want to do and what I wanted to change. So I said, Coach, see, he, he did that to me. And then I was like, next sparring session, I want him. I want, I want him back in the ring. So he, so the next time, I was like, no, no, I don't want to spar with them. I want to spar with Dustin. So, so, they, so I called him out, got him in the ring. I said, I'm going to knock him out. So we get in there to spar him, and, you know, we're going through it. Boom, boom. And, and and I started hitting him hard. So we were going at it. He was, you know, he was doing this thing, you know, because he's more better than me, you know. He's, he's more advanced. But, you know, and I'm blocking and doing whatever. The last round, he's coming at me. And he, he throws a, a one-two. And I lean back on my back foot and, and just threw a hook. Hit him with a hook. And he flew out of the ring, you know. <laughs> he, like, he, like, stumbled. Like, he was dizzy and he stumbled. And he, and he flew out of the ring. He landed on his feet, though. He's like, what the, you know, and then and then it was over. The sparring session was over or whatever. The next day he came, well, he went into the, the office or whatever, and then he, he left. I guess he left or something. The next day he had shades on. We all had to go do our um our eyes and stuff. We got our eyes dilated and, you know, the EKG and stuff like that. And this fool shows up to everything late. He he has shades on. He takes them off. Everybody's like, oh, my goodness, what the? You got an eight-hour shiner. <laughs> So his eye was like closed shut, like big purple, red, you know, crazy black eye. It was like insane. It was so big. And I did it to him. And, and like after that, he basically quit boxing. Whoa. So I like ended his career. He was like a high ranked amateur. You know what I mean? Like he was he was doing his thing. You know what I mean? But I was the one that pretty much he, he, he lost the love for boxing once I gave him that eight ounce shiner. <laughs> and this, you know, the the whole scenario you're describing, and uh, Morgan, you, your boy Shannon yeah, Jones yeah. is a part of this. You, that you, was with All American Heavyweights, right? Yeah, All American Heavyweights. So, so, so Shannon Jones, who who was involved in that, he was a, a teammate of mine, college football at Northwestern. He was a kicker. I was a wide receiver, and I got along well with the kickers because we were all nerds. Uh-huh. <laughs> What, what was that whole experience like, you know, just being around and being filmed all that? T- because your introduction into pro boxing was obviously a whole lot different than other guys were, you know, being around Dominic Brazil and, and all the other guys that were a part of that camp. Yeah, like, um, it was just, it was like a really fast progression. Like, we, it was a fast track, you know what I mean? So so basically it was like either you swim or you sink, you know what I mean? Like, They'll cut your neck. They'll cut your they'll cut your nuts right from up under you. You know, so they were like every day prompt. Come on, come on, this you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do that. It was just like a freaking factory of 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 heavyweight robots. You know what I mean? And like we were freaking. That's how it was. It was it was so we were so disciplined. Like we were so on it because we had to do it, or, or they'd be out looking for the next people. You know, they bring a new shipment recruitment of of guys. You know, elite athletes. You know, college football players college basketball players, whatever, you know. And I wanted to remain a part of this of this school, man. I wanted to get the best out of it because I felt this was the last opportunity for me to, you know, display my, you know, athleticism and, and have a, have something, you know, a career at something, you know. Um, with athleticism, you know, since I'm so tall and stuff, you know, I was a tall guy. I didn't want to be, you know, stacking, you know, food on the, on the freaking – shelves of Walmart, you know, and having people like, oh, can you reach up there and grab that for me? <laughs> You're so tall. <laughs> did, you, did you play basketball? You know, I hated that, you know, so now I can say I'm a professional boxer, I'm a heavyweight champion of the world, you know, and that's what I wanted to have, you know, under my resume. That's what I wanted to be known as because that's just that's just something, you know, letting, letting a God-gifted talent, you know, and being so tall, you know, and just let it go to waste. I always felt I didn't want to let my my height and stuff like this, these advantages that I have go to waste. Well, at, yeah, at, I, at, at what point did you, it. at what point did you think that was actually a possibility? Because I know there was a point when you didn't think that not only becoming a, a boxer, but certainly winning the, a heavyweight championship, uh, that you didn't think that was possible at all. It was there a moment when you realized that was a real possibility that you could not just make a living out of this, but, you know, thrive financially doing something like this as well. Oh yeah. Um, when I won my NABL title, when I first won that belt, and then I, and then that sunk in, 
And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually ranked in the world. You know, I'm like a world-ranked fighter now. And, I'm, you know, I can, I, can, I can keep going. You know, I can be more successful with this, you know, if I keep winning. If I keep showing up to these fights in shape, you know, and, I, and, and I'm able to, you know, get my punches off. Because we have a saying, you know, that fatigue will make the, the baddest man into a wussy. You know, it'll it'll turn the baddest man into a coward. You know what I mean? So you don't never want to show up to a fight to where you're 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 um, second guessing yourself and 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 not and scared to let your hands go because you're scared to get tired. You know, so I always even with but but honestly with you know fatigue like that can that can your nerves can affect your for your you know being fatigued mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It could affect your stamina. So I, that's why I was so calm. You know, I, I learned to be really really calm. I'm laid back person by nature, but you know, just be calm and 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 you have more energy in the ring. So yeah, man, it's just once I won that NABO heavyweight title, man, I said I can. My next my next goal is to be a world champion, man. You know, I could I could keep setting these small goals and accomplishing them to reach my ultimate goal. You know, so I just kept winning, kept winning. Those are small goals, you know. It, it's a goal. It's, it, it's an important goal, but it's a small goal. You know, just keep winning my fights. They pick a fight, I fight, I win. Pick a fight, I fight, I win. And then, you know, it got me to a title shot. So that was my ultimate goal. And I said, hey, it's right here. You know, I'm knocking at the door. All I got to do is open the door. Right. And on, on January 16th, I opened the door, man. I walked through. You know, so it's only the, the beginning. You know, I'm on a unified belts. Um, I want, I want all the belts. Um, yeah, but before I leave this sport, man, I, I want, I want to go down as an undisputed heavyweight champion in the world. So I listen. So you went from all American heavyweights to heavyweight title, um, and there's another young man looking to do the same. Dominic Brazil won his fight uh, by knockout over the weekend. Um, mm-hmm. How do you feel about facing him for real for the title uh, in the near future? Oh yeah, man. You know, like we can do it, man. Because what I've seen, what I've seen of him, you know, what I'm saying, like that's that's a good congratulations to him. You know, he won his fight, but I don't see him being on my level. You know, because you know, I got I got a lot more, you know, for him to have to work handle. You know, than a mere man so. You know, like I would, I would have been a mere man sore up as well. You know, but hey, I can't, I can't wait because because last time we were supposed to fight, man. You mm, know, I yeah. said nothing but good stuff about him, and he and he kicked my back in. You know, he he he's, he's my friend. You know, he kind of kicked my back in on the low. You know, um, in in his interviews, you know, prior to to our to our, to our bout. You know, so I'm not salty about it. You know. Obviously, you know it ain't a big deal. I ain't salty about it, but if he, if he wants it, man, he can get it. That's real. All right, one last question like, before he can't beat me. <laughs> one uh, one last question before uh, we let you go. I know you have you're you're a champion of the world now. You have a title belt. Obviously, you have the payday that uh, that comes along with that. Uh, I know you said you're looking to use your passport for the first time and maybe get to travel and go see some museums. Do you do you have a celebratory trip planned uh, with the paycheck and to celebrate the heavyweight title? Oh man, I, you know what I. I can't, man, because I, I want to get back to camp. You know, I, I plan on fighting within the next um, two, two, two to two and a half months, man. So, you know, I'm just gonna go and see my family. You know, a, a few states over, like in um, Colorado. I'll be back here freaking Friday. Um, so tomorrow I leave, and I'll be back Friday. And then, hey, we're gonna um, take it back to camp, man, and just start back training because this this is the only the beginning man and it, and it's just feels so good i'm just so i'm just so motivated man it, it like really motivated me to you know just take it to as far as it can go you know to the limits i want i want i want to do the most in boxing you know i just want to unify man that's that's my next step well, you've definitely got the uh, the work ethic to make that happen man thank you so much for joining us and uh best of luck hopefully no uh, we will see you in the ring in the next three months Right on, man. No problem. No problem. All right. Take care. Enjoy. All right. You too.
All right, that was uh, Charles Martin, the IBF heavyweight champion of the world. We will be back with more of Fight Network Boxing Weekly after the break. Welcome back to Fight Network Boxing Weekly. Corey Yardman and Morgan Campbell here with you. A big thanks to Charles Martin for uh, joining us on the program. And now it is time to add to our YouTube Classics playlist. Morgan, what do you have for us this week? You know what time it is, Corey? Is it hawk time? It's hawk time. Yes, it's hawk time. <laughs> it is hawk time. Uh, August 2nd, 1980. Antonio Cervantes, the legendary uh, junior welterweight champ, uh, Colombian guy who also had a, a base in Venezuela, Kid uh, Pambele, travels to Cincinnati to defend his WBA uh, junior welterweight championship against Aaron the Hawk Pryor. And this is uh, it's, it's kind of old Cervantes. Um, he <laughs> He drops, he drops Pryor early in the fight. But if you've watched Pryor fights, and you guys will see it now, uh, Hawk time doesn't even really start till Pryor gets dropped. And then when he gets dropped, look out. <laughs> well, uh, we talk all the time about trying to appeal to mainstream fans. Yes. One fight that people always ask me about is what would happen if Mike Tyson fought Rocky Balboa? <laughs> people that never, uh, no, never really watched about they know those two names. Well, Tyson and Balboa have actually fought each other. Daryl Tyson and <laughs> Jaime Balboa back in 1990. Nice. If, if you grew up watching midweek televised boxing, yes. Daryl Tyson, the guy you saw all the time. Daryl Tyson, Terrence Alley. Yes. Uh, Cornelius Boza Edwards. Exactly. Um, Harold Brazier. They're all there. Yes. So these guys fought for the NEBF title back when that meant something in 1990 in San Antonio. A pretty good fight, and you could find it on YouTube. We will add it to the playlist. But we are all out of time. We'll be back next week with more. Thank you guys for tuning in. <laughs>